Shades of Dragons by Kate Myers, illustrated by Marie Rose Boisson. There is no dragon in the fireplace when Mikoto wakes up. They're supposed to be. Everybody gets chosen by a dragon and always at the age of 10. But on the morning of her birthday, Mikoto pushes open the metal screen that is meant to keep the flames safely inside the fireplace and finds nothing but burned newspaper and bits of wood. The ashes are cold and gray between her searching fingers. They should be fresh and red, with her little dragon buried underneath them for warmth. At her birthday party the year before, Mikoto had a silver balloon that floated upward on its own. All the way through cake and presents, the balloon bounced happily against the ceiling. But every day after her birthday, the balloon sank a little bit closer to the floor. Eventually, Mikoto found it lying on the living room carpet, shriveled and almost completely out of air. She threw the balloon away after that, but now Mikoto wonders if she might have swallowed it instead. She feels like something inside her stomach is deflating. Did I do something wrong? She asks her parents when they come downstairs. Dad's dragon, Buck, wanders over and noses at the empty fireplace. He's fully grown, the size of a large dog, and so Mikoto has to move over to make room for his glittering red arms and legs. A puff of steam from Buck's snout turns the piles of ash into a tiny tornado. His yellow eyes search the corners of the fireplace for a baby dragon that might have hidden away. When he still doesn't see one, Buck rumbles out something that sounds like a question. You didn't do anything wrong, Mikoto, Dad says. His blue eyes are warm, and he smiles a little when Buck abandons the fireplace to nudge at Mikoto's arm instead. There must be something, though, something that Mikoto did wrong. But she can't think of what. She took the logs out of the fireplace before bed to make sure that her little dragon wouldn't hurt itself when it came in. She made a nest out of the ash and bits of newspaper so that the dragon might have a soft landing. And she spent all night beneath the fireplace, curled up inside her sleeping bag and counting the minutes with a smile until she fell asleep. But mom just pats her own dragon, Nagisa, on the neck and agrees. You didn't do anything wrong. Your dragon just needs more time. Mom and dad convince Mikoto to leave the fireplace so that they can cook her breakfast. Her plate is a mix of the fruit and porridge that Dad eats in the morning and the steamed rice and rolled omelet that Mom prefers. The food sticks inside Mikoto's mouth like lumpy glue, and even the thought of birthday cake after school doesn't cheer her up. After breakfast, Dad works on the dishes while Mom goes with Mikoto to put her sleeping bag away. Mornings are for stories from Japan whenever Mom is around. Sometimes tales of umbrella monsters that hop on one leg and look with one eye. Other times, stories about princesses born in stalks of bamboo. Today, Mom talks about dragons. Mikoto doesn't remember much about living in Japan because they moved to America when she turned five. But she does remember that all of the dragons there were blue. Dragons in Japan come from water, not fire, Mom explains as she rolls Mikoto's sleeping bag into a neat circle. Nagisa snorts in agreement from her spot on the living room carpet, where she's lying in a tangle of clawed feet and sky-colored scales. They're born in riverbeds and along ocean shorelines. They learn to swim before they can walk, and they don't come out of the water until they choose a human. Mikoto sits on the floor next to Nagisa and squeezes her eyes shut tight. Sometimes, if she does that while Mom talks, she can remember flashes of blue scales beneath ocean waves. She can see pretty pink flowers in the trees and paper lanterns in the streets. She can feel beach sand between her toes and smell salt on sea air as mom points to dragons twisting like ribbons in the shallow waters. Dad's dragon is red, Mikoto says, once the sights and smells of Japan fade back into memory. Everything in this tiny Arizona town is red even the clay in the desert that surrounds them. That goes for the dragons, too. Mikoto peeked into the older kid's classroom at school once on her way to the restroom. Inside, she saw an array of rust-colored wings and copper scales. Little scarlet dragons snapped playfully at hanging shoelaces. Another one, the color of fire engines, gleefully shredded paper from somebody's fallen notebook. 
Even the teacher had a cherry-colored dragon snoozing on her desk, releasing puffs of steam into the air every time it snored. Mikoto almost can't believe that dragons of any other color could exist, except that Nagisa's long blue snout is right there in her lap. Yes, Buck is red, and your father found him in the fireplace, Mom says. Buck rumbles happily from the living room sofa because he loves being the center of attention. Nagisa swats at him with her tail. But Nagisa is blue, and she came from a river. Confusion digs lines between Mikoto's eyebrows. I don't understand. You come from both, Mom explains. Not completely red, and not completely blue. Both are important parts of you, Mikoto, and that's very special. Mikoto thinks about her plate at breakfast. Dad's porridge, sharing space with Mom's rice and rolled omelet. Your dragon must be special too, Mom continues. So give your dragon time to figure out who it wants to be. Tenth birthdays are important. People pay attention when they come around. Everyone knows that today is Mikoto's tenth birthday, and so going to school without a dragon is terrible. Mikoto's classmates rush her the second she steps through the doorway, but their faces pucker and pinch when they realize that she isn't carrying a new bundle of wings and red scales. They skip back several steps and whisper behind their hands. They point at Nagisa, who follows Mikoto's mom as she drops off Mikoto's birthday treat for the class, and murmur something to the teacher who nods. When mom's bright blue dragon sneezes and sprays an entire row of desks with water, there are gasps that echo across the classroom. Mikoto feels her brow wrinkle with confusion, because it isn't like Nagisa is new. Living in a town so small means that Mikoto and her classmates have been together since she moved here at the age of five. Back then, when dragons only existed as the idea that they would have one someday, Mikoto's classmates noticed Nagisa's blue scales without seeming terribly interested in them. It was the same with Mikoto's black eyes and the way she said words in Japanese sometimes. The other kids saw the differences, but thought that playing together was more important. But Jason Jones returned from summer break this year with a dragon on his shoulder. Now dragons have become the most important topic inside the classroom, and Mikoto has started to see differences of her own. She can feel her classmates' eyes tracing the black of her hair, so unlike their own sun-baked yellow and brown. Mikoto can see them sounding out the letters of her name when the teacher takes attendance, as if to test the way that it rolls differently across their tongues. Mikoto's lunch from home comes in a box instead of a brown paper bag, and the food inside is just like her breakfast plate. Peanut butter crackers share space with pickled vegetables and rice. But which are you for real? Callie Fields whispers across the lunch table later that day. What color will your dragon be? Mikoto doesn't have an answer because she didn't know that she had to choose. You don't, Dad says on the car ride home. You're Mikoto. That's all you have to be. Mikoto curls her legs into the seat of the car and hugs them close. It's true, though. I'm not the same. Sure, Dad agrees. But different is good, right? Mikoto shrugs and tries not to smile at the way Buck is attempting to cheer her up by blowing smoke rings at the ceiling. That night, they pack dinner and Mikoto's birthday cake into a picnic basket and drive to the Colorado River. The hills around it are as red as Dad's dragon, as red as fire, and the clay out in the Arizona desert. Even the river water looks coppery, with so much red surrounding it. Buck burrows in the dirt, making himself a den out of rusty soil and tree branches. Nagisa wanders to the riverbank and settles down, dipping her tail into the water. Mikoto and her parents sit on a folded blanket beside some scraggly bushes and pass plates of food back and forth. We should do the cake before it gets too dark, Dad says. Hey, Buck, want to light the candles? Buck opens one eye from beneath his bed of dirt. He unburies himself with a grumble, shaking the soil from his scales and stretching his leathery wings wide. Once clean, he walks over to their blanket and sucks in a deep breath. A tiny jet of fire blows from his snout, lighting up the birthday candles on the cake and also a part of the bush behind them. Your dragon needs to work on his control, Mom tells Dad with a smile, as Dad beats the flames out of the dry green leaves. No kidding, Dad agrees. To Buck, he says, 
I said to light the candles, buddy, not the shrubs. Buck snorts, almost putting out the candles he'd just lit, and Mikoto laughs. She curls forward to protect her candles and the birthday wish that they carry. But a sudden sound from Nagisa stops her from blowing them out. Nagisa roars once, like a surprised yelp, and then there is a smallish splash from the river. Buck moves first, flying upward with a powerful burst of wind that really does put the candles out. He circles the river once before setting down next to Nagisa. The rest of the family abandons Mikoto's birthday cake on the blanket to join the dragons on the edge of the water. There, struggling out of the water and onto the red dirt, is a tiny dragon. His snout is only a few inches long, his wings are thin and fragile, and his scales are coated in mud. He makes a sound, a little squeak of annoyance at his difficult climb. And then he spots Mikoto, who is kneeling on the riverbank with her mouth open, and heads right for her with a happy trill. The balloon that Mikoto thought had deflated inside her stomach suddenly fills with air. Her heart beats hard inside her chest, and her mouth is very dry. She suddenly has smooth, wet scales in her lap and claws the size of thumbtacks pricking at her legs. Big yellow eyes blink up at Mikoto, and the dragon keeps making that trilling sound, like he's asking why Mikoto is so late. Mine, Mikoto thinks, and squeezes her dragon close. Buck is inching closer, making snuffling sounds as he sniffs at the new arrival. Nagisa watches with her head tipped sideways. Dad brushes at the baby's scales with a laugh and says, He looks purple. A blue dragon out of a red river, Mom agrees. She's smiling too. Not just one or the other. But that's good, Dad says, and then nudges at Mikoto's leg when she chooses to keep hugging her dragon instead of responding. Right? Right. Mikoto grins down at her dragon, who is now narrowing his eyes at the sniffing Buck. He lashes out with his little tail, hitting Buck in the snout, and Nagisa snorts. Before, her classmates asked, What color will your dragon be? After an empty fireplace, Mikoto wasn't sure. Now, with a lap full that's just right for her, she can finally find her answer. Mine, she thinks again and hugs her purple dragon close.